and welcome to another distance learning AP psychology lesson. Today's topic is attitudes. Um, so the objectives of the lesson, we're going to continue to explore the relationship between situations, dispositions, attitudes, and behavior with a focus on how your attitudes and behavior influence each other. We're also going to be analyzing a number of real world examples today. So be prepared to kind of stop and start the video and go and watch some alternate video clips when prompted. All right, so what is an attitude? An attitude is a set of beliefs and feelings that predispose you to react a certain way to objects, people, or events. A predisposition is like a, like a setting in your brain or like a pattern so that when you get into that event or situation, you kind of have a default reaction or an automatic reaction. Um, it makes it more likely for you to react in sort of a positive or negative way. If you've ever been told you have a bad attitude or you need an attitude adjustment, this is what people are referring to, your set of beliefs and feelings about a particular topic or situation. Um, attitudes have three basic components, affect, behavior, and cognition. And remember, in psychology, affect is a noun that means emotion. So let's say my attitude is really positive towards pizza. That I love pizza attitude is going to have three pieces. First is affective, emotional. I love pizza, it tastes good. The second component is behavioral. How do I act? Well, I eat pizza five times a week. That's my behavior. And the third component is cognition. How do I think? What are my beliefs or schemas about pizza? Well, let's say my schema is that I believe pizza is healthy because it contains all the food groups. So if that is my set of components about my attitude towards pizza, then when I'm at a party or there's a buffet, I'm much more likely to choose pizza over another food. It would predispose me to react positively towards pizza. These attitudes can be explicit, meaning you know about them and you can consciously tell people, or they're implicit, meaning you don't really know about them, they're unconscious, but they bias you to react in a certain way. And we're going to come back to the concept of implicit attitudes and implicit biases later on in the unit, um, but for now, just keep in mind that your attitudes, you can either know about them or not. So now the question we have to explore is, what is the relationship between attitudes and behavior? Um, can attitudes influence behavior and can behavior influence attitudes? We're going to start with attitudes influencing behavior. Um, and yes, of course your attitudes can influence your behavior. That's kind of the whole point. But there are some pretty limited circumstances in which your attitude is going to be the primary determiner of your behavior rather than the situation that you're in. The first criterion is that the outside influence has to be minimal. If you're in a powerful social situation, that typically will dominate and modify your behavior. The second component is that the attitude has to be specific and not general. The attitude needs to be specifically about pizza in order for it to affect my behavior towards pizza. If I just have a general attitude towards food, that's too broad. And thirdly, explicit attitudes influence behavior more often. Uh, implicit attitudes are a little bit weaker, so they tend to be sort of supplanted by um, habits or other people's expectations or the directions of authority figures. So explicit attitudes um, tend to influence your behavior more strongly. Now let's talk about behavior influencing attitudes. There are a lot of different ways how you act can kind of seep into your head and change how you think and feel about the world. The first way is called the foot in the door phenomenon and this is actually named after a sales technique. Um, if you wedge your foot in the jam of a door it can't close all the way. So the person has no choice but to open the door all the way and let you in. That's kind of the analogy we're looking at here. So the phenomenon is if at first you agree to something small, you're much more likely to agree to something bigger afterwards. Basically, doing small favors or agreeing to small requests from a person changes your attitude towards that person. It makes you kind of think, oh, well, I wouldn't do these little favors for people if I didn't like them, so I must like this person. Um, therefore, if you like that person, you have a more positive attitude towards them, you're more likely to do bigger things for them afterwards. Second is self-perception theory or role-playing. We're going to come back to role-playing when we talk about a famous experiment in social psychology later in the unit, um, but for now let's just define it. So self-perception theory or role-playing is the idea that you are who you act like. Especially if you're uncertain about your own attitude or you're in kind of an unfamiliar situation. If you just pretend, you sort of act a certain way, you just fit in with everyone else what they're doing, that slowly will sink in and become part of who you are. You are who you pretend to be. Fake it till you make it, right? If you play a role for long enough, you become it. There's a lot of different sort of gangster and crime movies where sort of cops will go undercover and pretend to be, you know, in the mafia or whatever and slowly they get dragged into the life. That's basically self-perception theory or role-playing theory. The third 
a way that behavior can influence attitudes is called the door in the face phenomenon. If you deny a large favor first, by comparison, a small favor seems fine and you're more likely to agree to it. Um, so the example I have here, let's say Timmy asks his parents for $100 to see a movie. There's no way Timmy needs $100 to see a movie. That's excessive. His parents are going to say no, as they should, right? But then if he next asks them for $20, then the people are much more likely, the parents are much more likely to agree to that. Because by comparison, $20 doesn't seem like very much money at all. But movie tickets don't cost $20. So by using the door in the face phenomenon, Timmy is left out. Um, and that's actually greatly benefited. So the fourth one is the self-fulfilling prophecy. You unconsciously act in ways that bring about your own expectations. We've talked a lot about expectations before, and in psychology, expectations are very powerful. What you expect to happen is typically what happens, um, usually because you make it happen, right? If you expect, to, we talked about learned helplessness, if you expect to fail in a class, you're not going to try as hard, you're not going to study, you're not going to do your homework, you're not going to pay attention in class, you might sleep or skip class, and because you're now not doing all the work that you need to do in the class, of course you fail, right? So the self-fulfilling prophecy has kind of come true. By expecting to fail, you've done things unconsciously that make you fail. The interesting thing here is that other people's expectations of us can also influence our performance. The study here was done on teacher expectations, and it was found that teachers with low expectations have worse performing students. Even if it were the same group of students, the teachers that don't expect as much of their students don't get as much. Let's say if I have high expectations for my classes, I'm going to give you challenging activities, I'm going to push you hard, I'm going to make you work harder, I'm going to do more fun, interesting things because I think you can handle it, right? And so therefore, because the class is now challenging and exciting and interesting, you perform better, you learn more. Whereas if I have low expectations, I might repeat myself a lot, I might make you do a lot of boring drills, I might not... Um, I might assume, oh, these kids are going to fail anyway, so I'm just going to make the test super easy or whatever. But then the class is now not interesting, right? If you're being treated like you're an idiot, you're going to blow the class off because your teacher doesn't, you can tell that your teacher doesn't think you can do it. So why are you going to bother to try, right? And therefore, those students don't perform as well. So other people's expectations of us can also influence our performance, which is very interesting. At this point, I want you to pause the video and go and watch these three clips. The links are on slide number 18 of the notes, which I've attached to this assignment in Google Classroom. So go into the notes, go to slide 18, and click on these different video clips. As you watch them, try to identify which attitude influencing phenomenon we've just learned is, uh, is occurring in each one. Now that you've watched the clips, I will go ahead and tell you the right answers. Um, they are in the notes actually, of the slide. So if you go on slide number 18, in the notes, the correct answers to which clip is which phenomenon are written there. So now let's talk about the process that we use to make these attitudes change. Attitudes change happens in two different ways. Um, the first way is something called cognitive dissonance, which is a sense of um, discomfort mentally when your thoughts and your actions contradict each other. So if I believe one thing, my attitude is one way, but then how I act is different, which is true in a lot of these previous examples that we talked about. Um, once I'm be aware of the fact that my attitudes and my actions are different, I'm going to change my attitude to match how I behave because it's easier. We're going to change one or the other, either attitude or action, so that they match up. But most of the time, attitudes change because it's much easier to change how you think than it is to rewrite a behavior habit, right? Habits are hard to break, but minds are easy to change. Um, this there was some famous research done on cognitive dissonance by a guy named Leon Festinger, which uh, we will talk about when we talk about major experiments in social psychology. So I'm not going to go into the experiment now. We'll get into that at another time. So the primary way attitudes change is due to cognitive dissonance. If I have the sense that I don't like this salesman, but my action is that I'm buying things from him, the clash between buying things from a person, doing a thing, interacting with this person, and not liking them, which are contradictory, means that I'm going to change my attitude to match up with my behavior, and I'm going to start liking the person more. This is a little cartoon that I threw in, um, which I thought was funny and also demonstrates the principle of cognitive dissonance. You can feel free to read over, uh, pause this and read over the cartoon. Um, I'm not going to insult you by reading it to you, but I thought it was kind of funny. 
The other way that attitudes change is via persuasion. Um, and this model of understanding attitude change is called the elaboration likelihood model. What that means essentially is what is the likelihood that elaborating on a topic, discussing a topic more with someone, will make them change their mind, right? So elaboration likelihood model, there are two routes of persuasion, two ways that we can persuade people to change their thinking, the central route and the peripheral route. The central route uh, is actual arguments and reason. Like here are all the logical reasons why I'm right. Let me give you my sound argument and then you're going to have a reasonable sort of think about it and then come to a conclusion and change your mind, make a well-informed choice. That's called the central route to persuasion, basically using logic and rationality. The peripheral route to persuasion is where you are convinced by the confidence attractiveness and other personal characteristics of the speaker. If the person talking to you is very charismatic and confident and they look nice and they have good hair and a tan and everything else, you're much more likely to be convinced by whatever they're saying, even if it's nonsense. So I want you to stop here for a moment and think about which method, which route to persuasion do you think is more influential on people, the second, the central route or the peripheral route? Truly actually pause this video and just think about that for a minute and come to an answer for yourself. Now, hopefully you've had a think. The correct answer is that the peripheral route is much stronger. It's unfortunate because we'd all like to think humans are logical and rational and make good decisions, but that's simply not the case. I mean, we are rational, but we're also very easily convinced by charisma. And I guess you could call it swagger. If someone is um, confident and attractive and charismatic, we believe them. Um, there was a study that was done with the just headshots, just photographs of different candidates in local elections. And so they would take these headshots around to people and show them and say, which person do you think probably won this election? Um, and one of the people would be kind of not the most attractive looking person in the world. And the other one would be more attractive and have like a nice smile and seem confident. And every, almost invariably, the people would pick the smiling, confident-looking person as more likely to win the elections. And what's even more interesting is the smiling, confident people actually do win elections more often. So not only do we believe that they have more power to win, but they actually do have more power to win simply because of those personal characteristics. So that peripheral route is pretty strong. Um, I have a video clip here. I want to say this is slide number 21, but it might be 22. Uh, if you go to that slide in the notes, watch this clip. And then come, it's a few minutes long. Watch the clip and come back and decide which route is demonstrated in the clip, central or peripheral. Once you've watched that other clip and decided, made your decision, come back for the correct answer. So the correct answer, this clip is a clip about the debate between uh, John Kennedy and Richard Nixon when they were running for president against each other. And this was the first televised presidential debate. It's famous because of that. And the people that listened to it on the radio or read a transcript were pretty confident that Nixon won because his arguments were better. He had better information. Um, everybody who only heard it or read it thought there's no way Nixon won hands down. The people that watched the debate on TV, on the other hand, overwhelmingly said that Kennedy won purely because he was young, he was good looking, he was attractive, he had a tan, he had good teeth. Kennedy went to the studio ahead of time and set up the lighting and made sure he had makeup on and everything ready so that he would look nice on TV. And because of that peripheral route to persuasion, he looked confident and he was attractive so people believed him more even though Nixon had better things to say, but he was a sweaty, hot mess, and he was falling apart on camera, so people didn't believe what he had to say, even though his arguments were better. Um, so the peripheral route to persuasion is much more powerful than the central. Uh, and that wraps it up for today's lesson on attitudes. There is a uh, practice activity I want you to do that's included on this lesson on Google Classroom. So go ahead and complete that and submit it, and then you'll be finished for today.